I'm here today with my very good friend, Richard Chilton, who's the CEO and founder of Chilton Investment Company. Richard, cannot thank you enough for having me over today. Really, really appreciate it. How I like to start the show is really to ask everybody what it was like growing up as a kid. Well, you know, it was a long time ago. Um, I grew up in Hohokus, New Jersey, which is a suburb in northern New Jersey. I grew up in the town which had was only a mile square, and it maybe had just 3,000 people in the town. It was a small town; everybody knew each other, and, um, and and so it was a it was a great life. It was a great upbringing. That's great. Now you ended up going to Alfred University, yeah. which which I love because most people in financial services who have been incredibly successful went to the Ivy League schools. Yet you didn't take that path. Tell us a little bit about what that was like. Well, I didn't apply, and I probably wouldn't have gotten in. Um, you know, it, it, I wanted to um, to be in pre med, and I also wanted to play football. Um, Alfred afforded me that opportunity. Uh, I applied to two schools. I applied to Boston College and I applied to Alfred. Mm -hmm. I got put on the waiting list at Boston College and I got into Alfred. And it was a, it's one of the great engineering schools in the country. And so it had a very much of a STEM background. But I had the greatest four years. And now that I get to play football and meet a lot of really great guys who I'm still close with in my fraternity. But it also set me on the path to um, finance. So for me, it worked out great, and I learned a lot. And um, I came out of their business school, um, you know, in the top of my class, mm -hmm. which got me my job at Merrill Lynch. Got you. Um, and in terms of, of uh, you know, coming to New York, how did you decide to actually go into finance? Where, where did that decision evolve from? Yeah, well, my grandfather was an investment banker in the 20s and the 30s. My dad was an advertising executive um, uh, and, and so I grew up in a very creative household, but he also, um, given that creativity, he also founded one of the first mutual fund distribution companies and, 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 and sold it. So I had a very um, stock market financial background. And so I remember that when back in 1980 when I graduated from college, there were no jobs on Wall Street. I mean, Wall Street was tiny. I mean, let's go back. Morgan Stanley's book value in 1978 was $30 million. Wow. So, so that's kind of interesting because when you look at now that Don, Don Sterling bought the Clippers for $12.5 million, that was a lot of money back in 1981. Um, and so my, because I was number one in the business school, my mentor, professor, um, who really helped shape my finance career, um, his roommate at Harvard Business School was the head of mergers and acquisitions at Merrill Whiteweld. And he said, he called him up and said, I got this great student for you. You know, you have to interview him. Right. And so I went down there and interviewed and got the job. Okay, so you came to New York, you worked at Merrill in the M&A yeah. department, which probably is tiny. Tony James was talking to me about DLJ when yeah. he went to DLJ and they had, they said that they hadn't done a deal in two years in the M&A group. I mean, it was, it, was, it was pretty small. But you worked at Merrill Lynch, you worked at Alliance Capital, um, and you worked at Allen & Company. Well, that was the pivotal real learning experience because T Tony and I actually worked together. Okay. Um, uh, Alliance was owned by DLJ, and, and, and it was, the money management business was very nascent. Very, it was just really starting as the talent drain came from the big banks and uh, trust companies into forming independent money managers to manage pension assets. Um, 1982 was when I joined, beginning in 1983. DL Alliance was owned by DLJ, um, and I was in the same junior executive training program as Tony was, a breakfast club, um, which Dick Jenrette formed. Um, but I got a call from my next door neighbor, who was one of the founders of Alliance, Frank Burr, who was my mentor. And, um, and, and, and he said, you know, I need somebody to come in as an analyst to cover small cap stocks in the mutual funds, but the mutual fund industry was small at the time. I mean, Quasar Associates was an award-winning small cap fund, but had $40 million in it when, and so it was all tiny. You know, these are tiny numbers compared to where they are today. So I went over there, met Tony and, and Garrett Moran, who, who, who was also one of the, the top guys, and first became an analyst and then became a portfolio manager in 1985. Um, and so learned all about how to manage long global ideas and small cap and mid cap 
back throughout the whole 1980s. Okay. Well, in terms of, obviously, you had a great run working at these, other, these various firms, and then you decided, ah, I'm going to go out on my own. It takes a lot of guts and chutzpah to do that. What sparked that decision? Well, I was prepared. Um, you know, my best friend in the world, Robert Williamson, um, his, grand, his um, uncle was Julian, is Julian Robertson. Mm -hmm. And so I met Julian three years after he started Tiger. And I remember him calling me up and saying, you know, what stocks? When you go see all these companies, you go to see, uh, wh which ones do you think are going to go broke? I said, well, Julian, why? why, why? He goes, because we're going to short those. So I said, well, geez, what's shorting? So he introduced me how to short. And Art Sandberg was a director of the mutual fund that I managed. And so between Art Sandberg and Julian Robertson, it, it, I kind of got introduced to the hedge fund business. For, Julian was earlier. And so when I left Alliance um, to go after we went public and I was a shareholder, I went to work at Allen Company because I wanted to do something a little bit more entrepreneurial. And that lasted two years in part because the unit economics weren't as attractive, and even though it was a fine place. I think it was an important bridge for me to leave the very collegial atmosphere of Alliance Capital to the hard scrabble world of Allen & Company, which is when eat more eat what you kill. That kind of gave me a transitional period to entrepreneurship. My dad always told me, and my dad was a really important role model from, from his moral compass and his um, moral fibers, but also he said, look, if you want to, you know, do really well in life, you really have to do it on your own. You know, I started in 1992, there were no hedge funds really, there were just a couple, it was not even an industry. Yeah. Um, but I knew one thing is that, it, you know, you have to put your flag in the ground. So I, I always dreamed big and I always said, okay, we're a children investment company, we have $5 million in assets under management and we're good at a classic long short A.W. Jones model. And I knew it was a field of dreams approach. Mm -hmm. I knew that if we had good numbers and good returns, clients would come. And we did, and they did. Yeah. And so, um, you know, but along the way, I put place policies and procedures that when we were big, it, there would be, they would just follow. Mm -hmm. And so, like, no personal trading and all that kind of stuff. And so I always kind of thought of ourselves as, like, the little big man kind of, you know, punching bigger than your weight because I knew someday that we would be bigger. Sure. Anytime you start a business, there are hurdles, yeah. okay? Um, You've got hurdles in terms of your business, things that can come out of the blue. You've got market corrections and all that sort of stuff. Um, how have those impacted you throughout time, and how, what have you learned from them? At first, I was not only managing the money um, you know, from market hours, but then I had to raise the money right after that. And then after the clients all went away, I had to manage the books and and keep the records and settle the trades. Right. You know, it was just me and a girl right out of University of Vermont. And so, um, you know, that went on for a while until we had gained some traction. You know, the business fortunately took off pretty well and we had a lot of assets fairly quickly uh, and the numbers were good. But the whole focus has always had, had to have always been the content, the numbers, you know, not asset gathering. Right. It, 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 because that's where people fall and fail, you know, they don't realize that we're in a business where we're selling a product that people have to want to buy. Mm -hmm. So then you always have to keep the numbers up and we've always focused on that. Mm -hmm.